All right. So we're in, uh, I don't know if this is week two, week three, I think we're in. Week three. Uh, we did the launch week, and this, so this is technically the week. Uh, um, so we talked about body language last week, and this week is the series, of course. <laughs> Get that out. It's a ripper. That's a famous sneeze, that one. And uh, if you're in front of it, I'm sorry, Tamsin, you have gel in your hair. So the... Uh, the uh, the series is called Say What, and, uh, and it really is about say what. And all right, so the series is called right. Terms and saying I say say what, and then you say say what back. So the series is called Say What. Now, now I want you to do it with some gangster fingers, right? And I had it go. Yeah, hat. Your best kind of impersonation of gangsters. Ready? Say what. You should see this. This is red. Anyway, if you're at home, look at the person next to you and go, say what? You know. Um, so anyway, this series um, tonight, um, we're going to be talking about a, a real, this is a favourite uh, of mine, uh, this topic tonight. It's all about coded language. Now, we'll explain what that means in a minute. And it's not, for those that know what that is, the Morse code. I just said, thanks for coming. You know, so uh, the... Uh, the two uh, aviators got that, but the uh, the challenge for me is when I was about 22, um, I uh, learnt about the idea of coded language in our life and how it manipulates us as individuals. And some of the stuff we're going to talk about tonight um, might be real for you. And this was for me growing up in a very broken environment. You know, dad was uh, an abusive alcoholic. Mum was never really around because she had to work so much to compensate for dad's uh, drinking behaviour. Um, so it was a violent home. So my brother and I ran a lot on the street. And there was a lot of coded language within our home on how uh, parents could manipulate their kids or attempt to. And then even as friends, and I could see patterns right through my um, late teens and into my adult years um, of how I could, somebody could say something and I'd feel almost manipulated and they haven't really said a lot and I'd almost feel guilty or I had to respond in some way because of this coded language that was kind of like keyed in to my DNA. And so tonight I want to talk to you a little bit about how to recognise coded language, how you do it, we all do it. All right, and uh, how you can stop it, change it, become healthier, and then how you can see it in your friendship circles, your work, your school, and even in your home environment. Now the challenge is tonight, and I hope you, you know, you're listening at home. So the guys, um, so you know, we have about five to six hundred that watch us online throughout the week following the Monday, which is really cool because you could really practice this at home too. So I don't want you thinking, yeah, that's what mum does, that's what dad does, that's what he or she does. I want you to try and figure out for yourself, is this how you live your life? Because we all do it and it's a form of manipulation. It's to get our needs met and it's manipulative. Yeah. Where do they watch it on? Like, where do it's on our Facebook page, so it's live streaming right now on our Bridge Builders Facebook, uh, Facebook page and then it's, re it's um, saved there, yeah? Is that right? Yes. Tech people? They're nodding. Yes, so that means yes. When they nod like this, it means yes. Um, so uh, when I do that, I don't even ask me where it goes. <laughs> it's somewhere out there. So you can go back and revisit this. Now, um, this, so this is over 20, uh, so I'm, uh, I'm 52. So I learned this when I was around 22, right? So I've, I've, I've tried to apply this idea of coded language for over 30 years to try and figure out how is it that it's built into us as humans to code one another into getting what we want? you know, done. And so um, if we can work against it, hopefully um, we become healthier humans and not so reactive to people's situations. So have you ever been, uh, how many of you like campfires? I, don't, I mean, not lighting them, I mean like hanging around them, you know, not, you know. So you like a campfire, right. Have you ever found that you're not so chatty, chat, chatty when you're around a campfire? What's the most things that sort of happen around a campfire? Scary stories. Scary stories, all right, yeah. Maybe even a group song. Yeah, we've got some guitarists that sing a bit of kumbaya. Yeah, like that. You know? Campfire song. A what? Just SpongeBob campfire song. Let's gather and the campfire. Let's gather the campfire and sing our campfire song. All right. Anyone that knows it. Anyway, yeah. What else, Holly? Roasted marshmallows. Yeah, have you ever burnt yourself on a roasted marshmallow? Yeah. Well, yeah. cool, that's nasty stuff, right? Yeah. 
Marshmallows, yeah. Damper, yeah. So a lot of food going on around this fire. But, you know, for me, sometimes just getting around a campfire gets me a little bit melancholy, you know, melancholy, where I get a little bit kind of reflective. <laughs> if you haven't seen the movie, it's all right. You know, but anyway, so I get a little bit reflective and I sort of sit there and, you know, you get a warm face and then you get a cooked face, so you have to turn around, you know, and then uh, just kind of feel like, yeah, well, you scratch your jeans real hard if you've got jeans on because it's like, oh, no, no, they're touching my legs, you know. So the, the thing is that you can get really reflective and really kind of moody and nice and lovely and romantic and it's all that sort of stuff. And um, the, the, the interesting part about a campfire is that usually, uh, if you've been there for a little while, you can get fairly vulnerable at that moment. You know, you kind of feel content, warm, you're not scared of the bear coming out of the forest, have you? Because we don't have bears in Australia, just so you know, so you don't ever have to worry about that again. And the boogeyman only lives in America. So the boogeyman and bear, not happening, all right? So the, the worst you're probably going to get is a rabid rabbit. You know, so uh, one with Mixo, but then it's kind of twitchy anyway. So Isn't that what they call it, a rabbit rabbit? Say so that six times really fast. Anyway, so here, here's the thing, right? I want to ask you a couple of questions. You don't have to answer these. I want you to ask these of yourself. Have you ever been in a situation and wondered why you feel a certain way? Uh, like a, and I'm not talking about a romantic way. I'm talking about the uncomfortable moment when you're in your home or you're in a, a friendship circle or at work or at school, or whatever, and you get that kind of, oh, man, why do I feel so... It's kind of weird right now. The other question you want to ask yourself is why, sometimes you might ask yourself this, is why am I so, and you can fill in the blank, why am I so needy, why am I so scared, why am I so insecure, why am I so, and you probably never say a lot of that out loud to people because you worry about how they might interpret that. And then the other part is why do I do, and you fill in the blank. So for me when I was growing up, um, I became, to hide what was going on at home, I became the class clown. So everybody kind of looked at me and was laughing and carrying on. People would dare me to do stuff, and I would do it. I remember that one of the um, year 12 guys said to me, I dare you to run off the car park and slide down the bank, you know, onto the oval. So I did. I said, easy. I was a year seven. I was the smallest in our year. So I was a little fella, and I thought, anything to get acceptance in this, I'll do that. Ran off the car park, down the bank, heard this noise. <laughs> and just kept sliding, you know? Got to the end, stood up, and half my knee was hanging open, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah! So plenty of stitches, not many broken bones in my body, but, um, but I, I look back on things like that, of things that I did in order to gain uh, somebody else's approval. And uh, I could have just simply said to them, I'm not doing it, you know? <laughs> Do it yourself, after you, mate, you know? So, uh, and I didn't. My family experience, because it was so dysfunctional, there were so many times in our family where um, uh, my dad would come home and he would say things like this, and this might uh, be similar to you, uh, he would say, oh, a lot of dishes in the sink. And I'd go, I'd look over at the dishes in the sink and go, yeah, yes there are, Captain Obvious, <laughs> you know, so... Uh, and then he'd say things like, it's bin night, or there's a lot of dog turd on the back lawn, or what would be another one that you might have, yeah? Go. Okay. Um, mum's all like, go check the bathroom, I'm like, yeah, it's still there. <laughs> go. <laughs> go check the bathroom. Now in mum's mind, the rest of the sentence is dot, 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 is filled out, but because Tamsin's, oops, you know, because... <laughs> Heather, I love you. <laughs> it's so funny. I think it's a crack up. I'm coming to your joint because we're both going down the corridor to check out your bathroom. So the, to see if it's still there. And the funny part about that is that, you know, can you check the bathroom? Is that what the what? Uh, yeah, can you check it? It's can you check it? It's not gonna run now, what's his meaning is can you go check that no one's in it because I want to go and clean it or I want to go and use it? Doesn't that? That's not what it means, doesn't it? It's still there. Now. <laughs> I would, uh, when I was uh, dating uh, my, uh, my wife at that time, she was, uh, well, we'd been her family. Now, her fa my family uh, in-laws were fantastic at coded language. I loved the movie, so I'd go to a movie, and I'd say, uh, right, oh, we're going to go and watch this. And my father-in-law would say to me, um, is that an appropriate movie? Now, I, now, he's from a different background than me. 
anything that was kind of R-rated below, it was appropriate. You know, a young couple, I didn't, I didn't really care. I thought, mm. <laughs> it's like murder, sex, drugs, rock and roll. It's an appropriate movie. For, but I knew, but I didn't get it because I didn't grow up in their home. I didn't know what that meant. I'd just go, yeah, it's a cool movie. It's got Denzel Washington in it. You know, it's got, you know, Julia Roberts. It's got, you know, uh, whoever, you know, some spunk. What's that Thor guy? What's his name? Who's, who's Thor? Chris. Chris. <laughs> you know, there's some man candy for you. So now, now the reality is, right, I grew up in this home, in, in this environment, and it didn't, my parents would let me, well, they didn't really control anything, you know, so I could watch anything, go here yeah, and do whatever I really like. And so then I move into this environment that's got code, but I don't understand the code because I'm new to this. And so if you've ever gone out with someone and you've gone to their home, boyfriend or girlfriend, and, uh, or whatever, you know, same sex, whatever, I don't care. If you go to your partner's home and all of a sudden there's this family dynamic going on and then later you get with your person, your, your partner, and you say, and they say to you, oh, you so didn't understand what mum was saying. And you go, what? And you say, mum was like trying to get more out of you. you go, well, why didn't she ask me? Would that be your experiences? <laughs> that's an answer, that's a question. So have you ever been in that environment where you've been in someone's house and you get questioned but you don't quite understand the question? It's weird, isn't it? It kind of makes you feel weird. I would walk out of these environments multiple times and go, oh, well, that was easy. And my wife would say to me, oh, you, you so missed that. Dad is not happy. I say, why didn't Dad say something? But that's how he says it. He says nothing. I go, eh? How do you say something but say nothing, you know? You just gotta say it, man. I'm a pretty straightforward kind of guy. Just tell me, not happy, Jan, I'm still going. But you're not happy. All right, so anyway, the challenge for us is in those environments is, uh, have any of you got any other examples of what you do in coded language? Or let me give you some examples from me first, right? And then if you can relate, whatever. So going out with a girl, what, how are you going today? I'm good. You're not. <laughs> How did you tell? I don't know. Well, everyone says. I do it. Are you all right? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, you can't say not fine. You can't say fine. No. But everybody knows fine's not fine. Here's another one. And fine. When you're asked, how do I look? Oh. Not fine. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> when somebody asks you, sorry, gentlemen. If somebody, if a girl ever asked you, how do I look? You figure that word out carefully, all right? Never choose the word fine or cute. You can look how you want to look. You can look, you can say hot. You can say, oh man. You can just say, oh man. Or you can go, oh. Because that might mean two things, right? It might mean, you know? But it depends on the tone of the, right? So you can go, and that's not a good one, but you can go, see? Just the slight tone change, it's coded language. You know, am I right, Josh? <laughs> so Ellie comes out, she's going, what do you reckon? You go, hey, oh, yeah. That's coded language that says, you're looking fine, babe. No, you're not fine. You are banging. <laughs> I'm not banging on it. <laughs> See, you're making it hard for us in this coded language thing, right? Say so good. <laughs> oh, no, you can't say good. Oh, yeah, you look good. Anyway, here's the thing, right? It don't matter what you say. They're changing, right? So that's just how it is. So the challenge for us, anybody else got something that you can, you can relate to, yeah? This might just be a me thing, but normally because I type in, like, text messages completely lowercase, whenever I use capital letters or particularly full stops, it means I'm being passive-aggressive and only my closest yeah. friends seem to notice that. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I just type in big text because I have to be able to see it. <laughs> it's not because I'm yelling at someone, it's just because I, oh, I, I forgot my glasses and I need capitals, you know, so, and then I get the text back and then I can't, I don't even want to read it, you know. Like, why are you yelling at me? Yeah, yeah right. It's a bit like full stops at the end of the text. Thought like the dot dot dot, just one dot. I don't know what I mean, passive aggressive. It's not funny. A full, how could a full stop mean aggressive? Hey? 
You can't have a full stop. Well, my English teacher said that a punctuation was appropriate, you know. Otherwise, it's just one big breath. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I've put a whole sentence together without punctuation, and it did not make sense, you know. Yeah. Yeah, we face, you know. I've actually used. Has anybody ever used the wrong emoji? Yes. Oh my God! I'm not the only idiot, you know. That's the wrong emoji to my mother. I sent one or something going like that or whatever, and uh, I think it was Beck said, "No, that's not that. That's not the appropriate." I'm going, "Oh God!" And it's no, that's not what that means. It's just the worst. I don't even care. Right on. Yep, Holly. Usually a bloke? <laughs> um, half the time it's a bloke, half the time it's a girl. Yeah, okay. Other coded language situations you've been in, yep? Uh, silence. Silence. Now, I probably learnt early in my, in my uh, childhood, silence, I saw what my dad said at times that provoked my mum. So if dad would come home drunk, he would say a couple of things. Both my parents are Scottish, so it's on, you know. So she's got the telephone pole. You come near me! Boom! You know, she'd rip that bitch right out of the ground and say, oh, bone on you, mother! No, no, it didn't. So anyway, gave you all images of my mum. If you'd seen my mum, she's about that big, you know. Yeah. Anyway, back to it. So the fact is that they're Scottish now. <laughs> the thing about our uh, our family is, for some reason, when we're loving one another, I don't even know if it was love. I don't quite know. It's not. It wasn't love. Now, when I figure it out. But um, when we communicated with one another, we'd like. Well, I thought it was normal relating, but we would yell at one another. Like, oh yeah, that's a you, you know. <laughs> hey, do it, you come back. You like that, you know. And I was now when my gal came into that environment, she goes, Oh man, why do you guys always scream at one another and go, that's the way you do it, you know? Because <laughs> you have to yell across the field in Scotland, you know. So the, the challenge is is that my my dad could say something, my mum would interpret that a totally different way, and it was on. Ooh. And so, in as a child and as a young person growing up, I learnt somehow in that language, that code, did not to speak at certain times when I felt this kind of unusual feeling of uncertainty or fear or nervous or anxious in a certain environment. And so I would be, and I, I could see myself, I carried that right through my young adult years and even into my relationship. And so there was the, the situations where I would, they would ask me a question about something and I'd go, hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to respond at any point? You know. And I've just and I would just get this feeling that I don't quite know how to respond because I didn't know whether it was safe to actually respond at that point. And usually for me, I felt like sometimes response in coded situations like that was a bit like stepping in a minefield. You know. Hang on, I can't feel a click. Oh God. You know, it's like I've pushed the wrong button. And then, and it's usually in relationships, and I'm not talking about just, um, uh, I'm talking about friendships as well. It's usually I'd step on something and not realise I've stood. Now, in, if you don't know this, in war there's this mine called the Bouncing Betty. Yep. Now, the Bouncing Betty is a spring-loaded mine that when you stand on it, it doesn't go off. When you stand near it. It's, no, it's when you lift your foot off. When you lift your foot off, it's got this spring load underneath, and it bounces, boom, boom, and it lifts up out of the ground. It's full of shrapnel, ball bearings and stuff like that. And it has about a 20 metre kill radius, you're right? So right round. So it's called a bouncing betty. And they used to step on them. And the minute you stepped on it, you knew everyone around you was a dead man. So they usually sacrificed the one person. Everybody went away. And then one person was, it's all over. So sometimes, for some reason, in my upbringing, there was times where I felt like I, was, I would walk into a friendship situation or into a relationship. And I felt like sometimes I didn't know whether I was going to stand on a bouncing betty. It was just like, oh, click. Oh, it's all bad. So the challenge for us guys is quite simply this. <clears throat> if you can imagine for a moment that um, we did a series a couple of years ago called uh, Fu or the Family of Origin and I took about 10 or 12 weeks to walk through and if you want to maybe later this year we could do that series again. It was really understanding what happens in our family and how that rolls through into our life. It was something that changed my life and it was changed uh, many of the Bridge Builders team. And so in that scenario, if you can imagine yourself 
as a tree, as a human, and you're planted in a particular environment, whether that's work, school, home, relationship, whatever it is, and as, the, as you grow up, your roots grow in. You know, they grow down into those environments, and they draw out of that environment the nutrients that you need. Now, in my environment, some of the root systems that I had were in damaged soil. So I was drawing information out of the ground or out of my environment that was negative, that was wrong, that was just distorted and it was coded. And so I would take that information, bring it into my being and then I would spread it out amongst my friends and my relationships and I call that the fruit. The fruit that would be hanging off here would be the way that I could manipulate situations, friendships and relationships in order to make me feel okay. And I would use language at times like this, uh, if you love me. No one ever uses that. If anybody ever uses that on you, if you really love me, you would. The minute someone does that, just step up to them and just go, <laughs> go, I love you. You know, that's how we do it. Because that is one of the most manipulative statements. And a lot of blokes in my year growing up, that was how they got women to sleep with them. If they were dating someone, they would say, if you really love me, you'd sleep with me. You would, oh, it does, no, it doesn't matter. Anyway, all those things, you know, uh, conscious. <laughs> anyway, so uh, I don't want to put anything in your mind you probably already know about. But anyway, so the, the challenge for us is quite simply, you might be the person that uses silence. How many of you use silence to manipulate an environment? 80% <laughs> of the room. So if we can understand that, now that comes from fear, right? And it comes from insecurity. When I look at my life, if you can imagine that you're driving down the road and there is these solid lines down the middle of the road that protect you at times, then there are these times where the road becomes um, disjointed. You know, one little line, little line, little line. And that's a place where you can overtake all that sort of stuff. I reckon that's how I describe my life sometimes. There have been times in my life where it's been solid, totally cool. Got it. I've worked this out. Then there are other times where there's been gaps along the way. And in those gaps, I kind of filled them in with whatever felt good at the time. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. I'll do that. Ugh, that didn't work so good. Maybe I'll try a different thing, you know? So it becomes a lot of trial and error. Now, my brother didn't trial and error a lot of things. He just kind of let life go. Whereas I was always getting into trouble because I would fill the gap with something else. So I had a lot of pain attached. So for you guys, if you can see that your environment that you are growing in is full of good and bad soil, because sometimes it's still good. Even in a negative environment, there can still be some good stuff that comes out of that. And then you have the fruit is how you then push it out and how you relate in your world, all right? So the challenge is this. I, um, I talk about the issue of shame versus guilt. Right? Now, what does guilt tell you? If you're a judge, what's guilt? If you need to move her, you can, darling. It's fine. If you guys need to help, it's all right. She's all right. She's fine. She's got it. Just uh, if you girls could just give them some room. She's just having a moment. The guys have got it. It's totally okay. So, um, the, uh, the challenge for us is shame. Say, uh, guilt says, I've done the wrong thing. So, if you go to court and the judge says, you were speeding, uh, you stole that thing, that's guilt. Right? You're going to pay the pr price for that. Um, and or go to prison, whatever it is. Pay attention this way. It's okay. Let, don't embarrass her. Just leave her be. She's okay. It's totally okay. We've been here before. It's okay. So the um, so that's guilt. Shame. So guilt says I've done the wrong thing. Shame says I am defective in some way. And we use shame all the time to manipulate people. All the time. And so the challenge for us guys at times is what kind of person are you going to be? Are you going to be the person that holds, that is forgiving and gracious towards people? Or are you going to be the person that just makes people feel like they're dirt all the time or less of a human? You ever done that to someone, make them feel really small, really low? It's not cool, is it? I don't need you to do it. You do? No. Yeah? I would think every time someone like, I don't know, tries to think they're better than me, I kind of stand up for myself and then because I'm a much bigger, taller frame, they're kind of like, whoa, she's really scary. And then I get known as the scary dude. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you, but have you ever been in an environment where you might, you might be a quiet? I've gone into quieter person, uh, into quieter environments at times, uh, and deliberately so. And then people don't quite know whether you're this or that. It, have you ever been like that? And you, you get too afraid to kind of 
speak up so then other people move away from you because they don't quite know how to engage with you a little bit. So, so code, your code then, or your silence, is fear, it comes from fear. It's like you don't know whether you're going to be accepted or rejected in that environment. And so I want to encourage you a couple of little things before we finish, and that is um, the word should is a, is a word that you need to remember. When someone says to you, you should do this. My, uh, my mum used to say to me, when my grandmother was in hospital, you should visit your grandmother. And I go, <coughs> right, why should I? She's a nasty old uh, person, you know? <laughs> Every time my grandmother rang myself or my brother, it was because she needed something done around the house. She had, you know, rallies around, but... And I go, what? <laughs> no relationship. She so said, she should. Now, I want to go and visit uh, my grandmother because I'm in love with her, because she's amazing. She's dead now, so it's too late, but whatever. You know, but I want to go. It's all right, when you get to my age, they die. You know, so um, hopefully before me. But anyway, the, uh, the, so the thing is this, right? So for, for you, if someone's saying to you, this is what you should do in your life, it's a friend, this, I know what you should do. I know how you should do this. I think you should go out with that person. I think you should steal that from the shop. I think you should, you should. If somebody's using the word should, that's a trigger word that you might be, be being manipulated at that point, all right? The thing you want to do, need, need to do, is about responsibility. So if your parents come to you and say, you need to clean your room, <laughs> do they say that to you? Mm -hmm. yeah. how, how many of you have a room that's like, you can't, don't even know where the bed is? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Is that you, John? <laughs> yeah, nice. We've had friends that it's like a goat track to their bed, you know? It's like the door. Have you seen Raiders of the Lost Ark or the tomb? And they're pushing back the stone? That's like getting into someone's room sometimes. Everybody push. And then you kind of walk in on the goat track, lie down on the bed. You know, and then you get up from the bed, make your way out. That's none of your rooms, is it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's your room, is it? Yeah, right. <laughs> so when your parents say to you or somebody says, do you need to do that? That's about responsibility. It's that you have a responsibility in a home. Um, you need to take bins out. It's your turn. Uh, you need to vacuum. It's your turn. That's about taking responsibility. And responsibility is totally okay. We should uh -huh, Take responsibility. We need to take responsibility. See, when we use the word should, it's a, that's trying to pull somebody in. So should, need, and then the, the, the third one I want to tell you about is um, want. Want comes from desire. I want to come to Bridge Builders. I want to help young people. I want to, to help you. I want to come out and mow your lawn. I want to... Uh, do these things. How many of you have a want? The thing that you absolutely love doing? Yeah? Oh, don't get me wrong. Why not? <laughs> Majority of people uh, travel. would say I want Travel. I want to travel. Yeah. Yeah? Majority of people would say I want my phone. You want, I want a phone. Majority of <laughs> people would say I want my phone. I want my phone. Mm -hmm. Majority. Yeah, sure. I want to play a sport. You want to play a sport? Uh, gaming and exercising. Yeah. Gaming and exercise. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> You want a job? <laughs> you need a job. <laughs> the one you want might be different than what you get, you know. So. I've got a voluntary job at the moment, but I want a job. Now, somebody who's manipulating you, Holly, could say you should get a job. You should. So it's got a different tone. Do you see how the word should in the wrong context can make you feel like you're not, you're not lifting, you're not at that kind of level that you're really performing well on all cylinders, you know, it's like you should. It's like guilt, it, you know, so guilt and shame, it's like they're trying to manipulate you through shame. So I want to encourage you today, guys, as you go into your packs, that in this week, um, have a look at the coded language you do. Now, that's the way that you respond. Now, if someone sends you a text message and you don't respond because you're in one of those moods, uh, because you're manipulating people at that point, and it's what we all do at times, right? That's that much. <laughs> now, the, de the danger about standing up here, as I see a lot of you go, hey, hey, you know, so, yeah. What happens if you just can't be bothered texting back? Mm. <laughs> yeah. I should well, be so reading. Well, you should. Right? Oh, I just can't. I'm not going to respond. 
So we've had that argument. You can go on on uh, the internet and you can find out what is the uh, uh, the time frame that you should take to respond. Now, I have had people in my world send me a message at say midnight. Do you think I'm responding at midnight? Yep. Not happening. Unless <laughs> I should respond. Uh, if they're dying, I'm responding. If they're just telling me something, it's like... I had a dream. <laughs> right, right at that point, I'm like asleep. You wake me up, look out. It's on. Because I'm going to tell you some things you need to hear. when we get. So, But the problem's this, guys. Shh, the problem's this, is they would text me at midnight and then at five past twelve, why are you not responding? <laughs> I would just get, are you there, are you there, every five minutes. I got one of them. I'd be like, why? I got it them. And they'll just send me a message after, and I'm going, are you serious? Now, I've had a face-to-face -face conversation with this person, showed them their message and their unhealthy kind of conversation with themselves, and, uh, you know, and by the end of it, it's got nasty. Why did you just turn the phone off? Yeah. 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 I did. Said, but then you turn it on. <laughs> you know, and there's like an hour and a half of message. Now, so here's the so thing, guys. Go to bed. Coded language is a powerful, manipulative tool. Silence is the one that is used most. And unfinished sentence. So if you could be a person that says, Josh, I would like you to help me with this thing. Not someone should vacuum the floor at Bridge Builders. Because then what we do is we wait for the person that reacts out of guilt and shame first. And you go, oh, oh, maybe it's my turn. Oh, I should. I should do that. So if we could learn just a simple technique of being able to put someone's name at the front or the back of something that you're asking them to do or to be a part of, you just show respect. And you begin to be, become less coded in your behaviour. This week, if you use silence as a manipulative tool to get a coded language message across, I want to encourage you, fight that demon this week. Just fight it. We all have times of silence. That's okay. What I'm talking about is when you deliberately make a decision to be coded through silence, you know, you know, we all know when we do it. Right? <laughs> so, <laughs> everybody do that. We all know. Come on, you've got to do it with me, right? Because you'll know. So, when somebody's coding you, you give them the finger, not give them that finger, but you know. Oh, jeez. You know, just go. All right? That's coded language. The best way I've ever found, and just closing with this, is um, the best way I've ever found to uh, confront coded language is to actually speak to it. And what I mean by that, is I would say to people, why are you coding me? Why, you, why can't you just ask me if you want me to do something? Why do you have to use emotion to manipulate me? Why do you have to use a language that makes me feel bad, feels shameful, feels low, less? Whenever you feel lower or lesser than, somebody's manipulating you with coded language. If you're doing that to somebody else, pull yourself up and just go, you know what? So I'm sorry. I'm trying to manipulate you right now to get what I want. Wouldn't that be a healthier way to relate? So guys, this week, I encourage you, in your packs, at home, in your person first. You can't go pointing it out here yet. You have to look here first. How do you code people? If you get huffy and slam doors, my brother was a great door slammer oh, yeah. and, and wheel spinner, right? So he would slam doors, take off in his car, and I'd go, oh, yeah. I've got them, the guys down my street. Just happened three o'clock in the morning. My son said to me the other day, Dad, did you leave at three o'clock in the morning? I said, <laughs> Nah. The only thing I'm going for is Maccas at 3 o'clock in the morning. And I was in a hurry. You know? So I said, no. The window was open next door having an argument. The girl took off and then the bloke took off after. Now the girl took off. The guy took off. I could figure which one that was. You know? The girl comes back five minutes later. Never heard from the guy. Oh, she's she probably lost so, him and then... <laughs> what a shame. She probably needed to. So, the, uh, the challenge for us guys is... Uh, too, too soon? 
So guys, when you're going to your pack, I want you to talk about a little bit about how you use Cater Language, because there's no point pointing at your friends yet until you identify you. Change you, grow you, then you can begin to become healthier in yourself. Let's go into packs, boss. What are we doing? Where are we going? Yeah, everyone should know where they're going if they don't come to me. Say so what? She's just So, welcome back to our third week of Bridge Builders News. I hope you enjoyed the last two weeks. They've been pretty good so far. At least I would say so myself that they have been. Anyway, without further ado, let's move on to some event news. So as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, we have our ballroom cabaret coming up in exactly three weeks from the filming of this, the Saturday, or two weeks and five days if... <laughs> or two weeks and five days from the Monday you're watching this. Now, while I say I've been running through a few of the details of the event, like you know, what goes on on the night and all that sort of stuff. But I haven't told you much about how you can actually help out with the event. Now, if you're interested in helping out on the night as either a waiter or a waitress, you'll uh, have to fill your name out on this lovely sign-up sheet. Looky, easily identifiable by the face on it. You can easily tell. I don't know who do that, but very good, nice work. And you need to be also over 18 for you to be able to participate in helping out at this event. So hopefully we get a lot of you signing up for the event tonight and I'll see the list nice and full of names at the end of the night. Thanks Hayley. <laughs> hey. Hi guys. We are having our bab for the second time in 2018 on the 5th of March which is in three weeks time so get you to office by six or before six or even earlier if you want and just hang out until the bab starts and don't forget to have your cards stamped four times. <laughs> and yeah, once you do the event you'll probably get a little tag like this like this and you can do all sorts of things and get a t-shirt like this or if you want a hoodie or track suit pants And yeah, it's going to be good, so can't wait to see you there. Because we are starting 2018, we have decided on two more tribes. The Golden Gladiators, which is a mustard flavour, and the Red Warriors which is ruby red so don't forget to bring your bandana along and remember there will be tribal challenge and it's coming each month so stay tuned so that brings us to another ending of the bridge Brothers news for this week i hope you enjoyed the event news you might got out of it maybe you'll even sign up for the cabaret Hopefully you're doing something useful with your life. And if you aren't, sign up for the cabaret because it's going to be a great day for everyone involved and we hope to see you there on the night. Ta? I am not a dog! I don't say ta to a dog, I say ta to like small children. <laughs> Stop moistening the seat, Alex. Just Hello and welcome back to the third week of the Bridge Builders News. As you can see, we're a very productive news team here. We we love to uh Enjoy. we love to get the news done in a nice timely fashion. We're not messing around in any way, shape or form and dedicated to the job and we know what we're doing, don't we guys? 